I'm here with Katie Bergman, uh, just a fantastic human being, author of When Justice Just Is, and currently the Director of Communications and Operations for the Set Free Movement, which is beautiful work, and you guys will get to hear about that very soon. Katie, thanks so much for making the time. Thank you. Good to be here. Great. So tell us your journey. How did you end up here, being who you are, doing what you're doing? What's that road been like? Hmm, great question. So it basically started from the time I was really young, um, when I was probably about seven or eight years old. I just I knew that I was called to live a, a life of justice, even though that term wasn't really in my vernacular. I just right. I knew that I was called to help and do compassionate work. Um, so uh, if you read the book, you'll see a few different uh, humorous ways that, that that took place of me trying to take on the world as this, you know, seven, eight year old thinking that I could fix, you know, fix all the brokenness. And, um, you know, once I got into the field, I learned that, you know, it's not actually as, as easy or as, um, you know, intuitive as I, as I thought it was as a kid. Um, so it's taken, you know quite a bit of a journey to get to this point. I've done a lot of international work. Um, once I graduated with a degree in human justice, I did um, some work with helping kids with special needs in Mexico. Um, I worked in California with uh, an organization that was combating human trafficking, mainly through social enterprise, and then ended up in Cambodia. And that's where I was working at the front lines, um, just helping people who uh, were sort of the most vulnerable to being trafficked, um, mostly to to labor trafficking. So in that particular area, uh, men were actually twice as likely of being trafficked, which really kind of turned the whole concept of human trafficking on its head for me. Um, but, you know, a lot of these things were a lot of really big steps. And I guess I kind of thought that to live, you know, a purposeful life, um, you know, you have to take those huge, huge steps. You have to move across the country and you have to work for big organizations and that kind of thing. And I think where I'm at right now is that, you know, sometimes it is about taking big steps, but it's also, you know, a, a process of taking a lot of smaller, sustained steps. Sure. Um, so I think that's kind of where I'm at right now with working with the Set Free Movement and, you know, with writing a book. Um, you know, it wasn't like I would just pump out chapter after chapter. It came down to word by word and taking out a word and reinserting a word and changing the word. And so... Um, you know, that's really what my journey is right now. It's just sort of sustaining that, that process. Right. What was a moment for you that set your heart on fire? Something that you saw or heard that, you know, that made you go in this direction of saying, no, this is what I want my life to, to look like. Yeah. So another great question. Um, so I would say sort of a turning point for me was when I was working down in Mexico, I was a missionary and um, I was working one-on-one -on -one with this little girl with Down syndrome. Her name is Julia and uh, she's about six years old or so. And um, we had, it, it wasn't a residential school. We'd go out and we'd pick up the kids and we'd bring them to, to school every day. And um, I just absolutely fell in love with this little girl and I never had any desires to have kids of my own. I wasn't even really a, a quote unquote kid person mm -hmm. um, and kind of thought that, you know, in order to seek justice, you know, I need to be doing this really grandiose, impressive work. And, you know, here I am changing diapers and wiping runny noses and doing right. you know, the least glamorous work you can imagine. Um, but I just absolutely fell in love with this adorable little girl who just saw so much joy in, you know, the small things in life. And, um, you know, one day we went to, to pick her up and she wasn't there. Um, so we were asking around, we were asking, you know, neighbors and other people if they'd seen this, this little girl and, um, nobody knew where her family went and they were probably the poorest family, um, in the, the school that we, uh, we worked in. They, you know, just had this house made out of garbage bags and sticks and when it would rain, their house would flood. Um, so I think that probably uh, her parents were involved in some migrant work and so they would move around a lot. But my first suspicion was, oh my goodness, she could have been trafficked. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that was when it sort of started me um, you know, on this path of, um, you know, addressing human trafficking and seeing that, you know, maybe I don't actually have to always be in a front lines uh, position in order to do this kind of work. Um, that was definitely what I did for the next few years, but now I'm kind of more in a role where I'm working, you know, behind the scenes and, 
uh, we need both. We need people who are working at the front lines. We need people who are doing the unglamorous work behind the scenes. Right. Uh, but it's all really necessary. When it comes to human trafficking, so many people want to do something to fight it. They want their life to be, uh, you know, against that and for the rights of people. You talk about being on the front lines versus being behind the scenes. What are some small ways that everyday people can be involved in fighting human trafficking? So with the organization that I work for, for the Set Free Movement, we believe that everybody has something to offer. So you don't have to have a degree in social work. You don't have to be a law enforcement officer. Um, you don't have to be a business leader. Um, if you have any of those strengths, that's incredible. Um, bring those to the table. But um, it's not always about being, you know, the most trained, the most experienced, um, you know, having a certain skill set. It's about using what you already have and using what you already know and what you're already good at for a greater purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got people from all different walks of life that work with the Set Free Movement. So we have, you know, a nurse down in Tampa that, you know, works full time in a hospital and she's training her fellow staff members. Um, and how to identify signs of human trafficking. So um, it's really just about using whatever skills you have. Right. Um, <laughs> tell us about the book. What's the heartbeat behind the book that you wrote? Yeah, so it was basically based on uh, one of my favorite quotes from Socrates who said that living well and beautifully and justly are all one thing. So for me, I always kind of thought that, you know, to live a life of justice, it's it's kind of second nature. It's kind of, you know, easier because it's focusing on the doing. Hmm. Um, but the living well and the living beautifully, that's more about being. Um, so I wrote this book primarily for people who work in the justice field. Um, but I think it can be applied to anybody's context. But I wrote it, you know, in hopes of encouraging people to create more of a balance in their life. That we can't just be completely focused on you know, just living a life of purpose, just, you know, getting the job done. You also have to live really well and, and live really beautifully, li really beautiful lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I was finding that, you know, the more that I forced myself to work really hard and, you know, being self-sacrificing, I wasn't really taking care of myself. And in order to, you know, take care of other people, we need to take care of ourselves along the way. What are some other... Um you know, maybe a, maybe a hidden talent of Katie Bergman that not a lot of people know. What is a hidden talent? Oh, yeah. That's, that's not fair. Um, well, it's, I guess it's not so hidden um, because I talk about it in the book, but I actually can plant a mean tree. Really? <laughs> I was a tree Green planter thumb. for about okay. three years. And uh, that's, that's sort of where a lot of my life lessons in the book and in the work that I do with the Set Free Movement comes from. Mm -hmm. um, because with that hidden talent came this um, lesson of just the importance of attitude and how, you know, I could be out, <laughs> excuse me, you know, on the rainiest day in the worst kind of circumstances planting trees up in northern British Columbia and just learn that if I can have a good attitude about this day, I'll get through it. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's a bit of a hidden talent, although it's, it's in the book, so I guess it's not that hidden. That's awesome. Okay, what is the biggest lesson that you learned um, from trees? You know, is it the, the importance of being rooted? Or, you know, what was like the deepest life lesson that you got from these trees yeah, as they so, spoke to you in the forest? I'm pretty to speak to me, but, you know, that could have just been the dehydration. <laughs> right. Um, so one of the quotes that just really kept me going during my days of tree planting was that a gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a person perfected without trials. Mm. So I love that quote because, um, you know, as I was tree planting, it was really easy to get resentful um, of the task at hand and to get exhausted. And I just realized that, you know, humans are made to grow and develop and to change and um, sometimes we need that adversity to uh, get us to that next level. Um, now, what I think that also comes with a cautionary side of it, because I think that sometimes um, we almost start to crave adversity right. for the purpose of growth. And we think that, OK, well, because I've grown in circumstances that were really difficult, you know, I need to go out and, you know, take the hardest path every single time so that. 
um, you know, I can grow the most and learn the most. And that's basically masochism. Right, right. That doesn't work. Right. And, you know, I, and I see that a lot in the nonprofit world where we kind of see self-care as selfish. We see boundaries as weakness. And so we martyr ourselves for the sake of the cause, which is never sustainable. So, um, you know, with that quote, with, you know, the whole idea of, you know, people needing to be um, weathered and perfected by trials, I think that also comes with a balance of knowing that there's a healthy amount of challenge that we need to have in our lives um, without, you know, willfully nailing ourselves to a cross. Right. So. Well said. How can we support the work that you're doing? How can we support the set free movement? What are some practical ways for people to get involved? Probably one of the easiest ways um, and one of the most tangible ways is just for people to look into their own lifestyles and see how they are either voting for or against freedom. Hmm. So um, a lot of human trafficking uh, <coughs> comes from labor trafficking. So a lot of people are forced to work um, in fields picking our tomatoes. Um, it's children in the Ivory Coast to um, you know, pick the products that end up in our chocolate. And so I think that one of the easiest ways that we can fight human trafficking, which is a, a business, it's a $150, uh, or $150 billion industry, um, we can fight that business with ethical business. So um, making sure that you're buying fair trade products, making sure that you're um, supporting good coffee and uh, you know other great companies that are working to um, create more sustainable ethical businesses where people aren't being exploited. Um, I think that's a really easy way uh, for people to get more involved. And um, obviously prayer and, and you know giving funds yeah. to organizations like the Set Free Movement is huge, but... Um, you know, really what, what human trafficking comes down to is, is the breakdown of community. So how can we live our lives in a way that supports healthy communities? How can we, you know, reach into our own uh, neighborhood and see the brokenness and see the cracks that need to be filled? And I think that we sometimes think that human trafficking is this thing that's, you know, far off and it's in other communities, it's in other parts of the world. Mm. Um but it's it's not as far from us as we think. It's in every single uh, you know city around the world. Uh, it's a huge problem, and it it starts with the brokenness in relationships. So how can we live our lives uh, in a way that uh, you know we're really focusing on loving other people? We're seeing you know who in our community needs help. Is it the the immigrant family that uh, just moved to our neighborhood? You know, is it the youth down the street that doesn't really have a safe place to go? Right. Um, you know, is it supporting foster care? Uh, is it finding, you know, some of the broken systems within our community that really need to be rehabilitated? So mm -hmm. I think it's just looking around us. And it may be about, you know, quitting our jobs and moving overseas and working for an anti-trafficking organization. Or it may just be about looking in our own uh, sphere of influence and seeing how we can affect change just in our own uh, communities. Brilliant. Brilliant. Katie, thanks so much for making the time and just for living life the way you do. Um, any last words you'd like to say to people? Some, an inspiring quote that you love or anything like that. What would you, uh, yeah, what would you want to say to help people live unleashed? I think um, if I can just employ the world, word of uh, Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson here, uh, he said that thoughts rule the world. And I think that that's what it really comes down to with living a life unleashed is that it's not always about being, you know, the most, the most skilled, the most educated, um, you know, the best at, at any one thing. It's just about believing that we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that goes back to our conversation about attitude that, you know, attitude really makes or breaks us that, um, you know, that's the, the driving force that, that leads us into new enterprises. And I think that a lot of times we, hold ourselves back and thinking that, you know, again, we need to be at that certain level of skill or intelligence or experience before we start something new. And some people call that perfectionism. And uh, some people might call that paralysis by analysis, where we overthink and overanalyze our ability to do something to the point that that opportunity passes us. And, you know, we've kind of made a decision by default. Right. So um, I think while any amount of skill and talent and experience that we bring to the table um, you know, is always a helpful bonus. Uh, I think the biggest thing is just that we need a good attitude and a willingness to at least try and that our thoughts are really, really powerful forces in that. Thanks for that. That's great. Katie, thanks. This has been great. Thanks for making the time and uh, keep doing cool stuff. Keep changing the world. 
Thanks. Same to you. All right.